the uh, your doctors. So I don't need to tell you that what you just heard was all uh, right brain stuff, right? I know he tried to bring in the left brain through saying there's a financial thing, but his thought was he's appealing to your emotions, right? As a patriotic nation, what's happening to us? So I'm going to take the discussion away from the right brain into the left brain. Okay, so, <laughs> and you need to, and the second thing is that the session that I'm going to do, there's one thing I'm not going to talk about, which I want to tell you, is I'm not going to talk about the markets. I know all of you will feel very disappointed. The reason I'm not talking about it is, I feel in order to understand the market, there's something far more important, which is the economy. So that's why my topic of discussion is the future economic outlook and I leave the markets to Atul to take forward when he does it, right? So that's the second point. The third point is that uh, Karan also made a point of, of China as a threat to us, right? So I again want, like I said, from right brain to left brain, I want to take China as a threat to China as an opportunity for us, <laughs> okay? So that's the uh, key. So if you're wondering what is it that I'm going to do, which is going to contradict what Karan says, rest assured, there's no contradiction. It's in fact building on what he said, where the opportunity comes in. At one particular slide, actually, I will refer to that as to how to counter this China threat, which he's talking about from a financial perspective. So before that, right, uh, when uh, Kunal and Dakeo uh, told me to suggest a topic, I chose this topic, okay? And when I chose the topic, and then he told me this is a bunch of doctors. Suddenly I got scared. I said, what is this? I'm going to talk economy and they're all doctors who are probably. And then this morning I got a big relief because when I met all of you and everybody was asking me stock related questions. <laughs> so then I asked them, you know, sir, all of them are experienced investors in the stock market. <laughs> Right, so that would be an ease in terms of this, but then it's all the more relevant. If you are investing in the stock market, it's all the more relevant that you look at this perspective to our lives going forward. Right? So, to take a... Right? So first, let me put together a simple framework in which you should understand the economy. And while I said I'm not going to talk markets, every single slide here has a relevance to the markets. Just that I'm not going to talk about it, but you cannot invest in the markets without understanding this framework. Right? The only thing this will not help you do is day trading. I can't tell you what the economy is going to do tomorrow. Right? But if you're going to invest in the market for anything over a year, 18 months, two of 20 years, understanding of the economic framework, what drives it and what's going to drive the market because ultimately the economy drives companies' earnings and the market is a slave to companies' earnings. The simple linkage is that. So, right? So what happens in economics? Right? In economics, right, you don't mind if I keep moving around, right? Okay. So in economics, right, it's basically the growth of demand and supply put together which determine the economic growth of a nation. Measured as right? Right? What is the issue here? The issue here is that two different kind of trajectories and forces drive demand and supply. Right? Demand either grows or decreases linearly. Right? Hero Honda sells 100,000 dollars of this year, they will have a 10% growth or they will have a 90% slowdown. But every year there is an incremental addition to demand or a decrease in demand. So demand follows straight line thinking. But unfortunately, unfortunately, supply cannot follow straight line. Hero Honda cannot set up 100,000 vehicles plant they have. Next year's demand is 10,000, I will set up a 10,000 plant. No. They have to set up a 50,000 vehicle plant to cater for the next five years demand. Right? Why I am pointing it out is this. This factor is what is the most critical in determining our lives in the financial markets. Because what happens is that economic or business cycles become inevitable because of this. The alternate between good and bad cycles. So what is an economic cycle? Right? Economic cycle comes when demand exceeds supply, but supply exceeds demand. So what is the impact on our lives? When demand exceeds supply, what happens? 
inflation goes up. Goods get costlier. When goods get costlier, what happens? What do companies do? Right? When, when demand is exceeding supply, they can set their prices. So their margins expand and profits in the stock market expand. When supply exceeds demand, what happens? Reverse. Reverse happens. Right? So automatically, so you can see how companies' profitability, which is what the stock market determines, directly correlate to the economic business cycles. It's not so simple. There is a little bit of a roundabout circle which I will not make and explain. <laughs> And this is something that each one of you should have in with you at all times. Understanding where we are in the cycle. So what I have described on the left here is what I would call a virtuous cycle, which is good, and what is called a vicious cycle. The two words are used, right? Demand, and this is the supply. Right? Supply comes from investment in families which produce the goods. Right? But they are not just these two. They operate with this thing called capacity utilization. So in the country, in a particular company, there's a capacity utilization. So when demand exceeds supply, capacity utilization goes up. Right? But what is this cycle? How does this feed into each other? Is where it's very important for you to be able to make the right kind of sectoral investments or sectoral allocation in your portfolio based on where we are the cycle. So at every point, it's important for you to be aware where we are. Second thing, there are certain things within our control as you, as a nation, and certain things not in our control. So you must be aware of that macro thing which is happening in the world which is leading to an Indian business cycle situation. So a good cycle typically has these things, right? You can start anywhere, that's the beauty of it being a cycle, right? Somewhere in every country at every point in time is somewhere around one of these two types of cycles. So what is our situation today? We all know that there is inflation is very low. We all know that interest rates are trending down. But we all know that demand is not going up. <laughs> right? That is the conundrum, that is the issue that we need to tackle. We'll come to that. At the same time, investment is happening, not happening. Supply response, we know is good because that's why inflation is low. So in this kind of a situation, right? What of a bad situation? So today we are in a very peculiar situation in India. What is it? We are having a demand situation of a bad cycle and we have an inflation and interest rate situation of a good cycle. So where are we? Here, Ardhangani, is it? Half here, half there? Right? Let's look at that in a little more detail. Then we can decide the future. So what's the current view? We all know, right? Newspapers are all over, the channels are all over. India is having a deep slowdown, right? So this slowdown, right? Let's diagnose it. When we diagnose the slowdown, so this is the consumption side. The GDP is composed of four components. A slide shortly will tell you those four. I'm going to discuss them individually first for you. So private expenditure, green line. Consumption of government expenditure, blue line. Mr. Modi came to power in 2014, so this starts roughly a year after he came to power. Right? See what's happening to private consumption. Between 5 to 10 percent per annum, consistently private consumption has been in this band. And suddenly last year it has taken up, last six months taken up down. Right? What's happening to government expenditure? Right? Government can spend on both revenue expenditure, like giving salaries, Pension, OIMP, interest payments of the government, or infrastructure spending, which is building roads, bridges, and all of that. Right? So, what's happening here? We see the Modi government was building it up, eased off, sharp bursts here. This was around the demonetization time. What did they spend on these two? The Pay Commission and the OIMP. Right? There's a huge spike in government expenditure, which naturally led to some of the spike in. Demand, private people then spend that money, but that critically has also started trending down most recently. Why did this start? What was this file? What is this down? This file was related to the election related spending, and this down is a post election government shutting shop and not spending. Right? So, why I'm saying is these are the two components that drive demand in the country. Right? Diagnosis will come to on what caused this. First thing, what caused this hit to demand? 
was the NBFC crisis and the public sector bank NPA crisis. The last time Indian economy was in a boom was 2003 to 8. In 2007-8, bank lending, just a proxy, this is not, doesn't include NBFC, it doesn't was a, growing at 30% per annum. Today it's growing at so what are the main causes for the decline in consumption is the problems faced by the banking system, notably the public sector banks collapse and the NBFC crisis. I don't need a chart to tell you about the NBFC crisis, right? So one causative factor, why we have to do the diagnosis? We are like a doctor, right? Without doing diagnosis, how can you do the cure? How can you do what to do with your portfolios? So I'm going to spend a lot of time on diagnosis to just to take you through this. So one contributing factor to the consumption slowdown is the lack of financing to the urban consumer. Now I come to a very controversial thing. This is an inflation chart. So and I draw your attention to the grey line. This is CPI inflation. Right? What is its status? Low inflation around 4 to 5 percent. Correct? Ideal for a good economic cycle. But you know why I am putting it up here? Because it's bad news. And what is the bad news you know? The bad news is that its inflation is composed of food inflation and core inflation. And then you look at what's happened in our country. Core inflation, which is the blue line, went up and then has been reasonably high and decent here. Core inflation consists of oil, imported oil and all of that stuff. But food inflation, what happened to food inflation? What is this? In November, December 2018, right? September to November, food inflation in India turned negative. How did it turn negative? Do you know? Bad monsoon. Bad monsoon. Bad monsoon. Bad monsoon should make prices go up, sir. Better supply. Think a little bit. Why I'm saying this is, I want to have security protection before I answer this question. <laughs> you know why? The person responsible for this negative food inflation, right, is Narendra Bhai Modi. And you'll ask me, why? Why would he do that? Because Modi ji knows politics. He knows that every non-Congress government in the history of India has lost its election because of high inflation. Right? So, what he did then, and this is not public information, he set up a program called the top program. When was the election? The election was in May, right? So sometime here he set up a top program. The top program's job was nothing but to manage down the prices of commonly used vegetables by the women of India. That is why it's called top. Tomato, onion, potato. <laughs> he created a nationwide buffer spot and made sure that every Monday, everywhere there was any chance of a shortage going, dump the stock. He succeeded in winning the election. But the byproduct of that effort was that the rural consumer lost confidence in making any purchases. Because this thing unfortunately severely has dented the rural India. And rural India is not the land owning farmers. It is the people who are dependent on the farm for the daily wage who are dependent on agriculture. Because automatically that price, everything translates to them, right? This is not something you will hear very commonly. Nobody will admit it. But that's the harsh reality. Because tell me, NBFC crisis is the common villain everybody blames for this for drop in demand. Auto sector correction, nobody is giving loans to auto sector. Are a rural farmer never took a loan to buy a motorcycle, yeah? Why he has stopped buying? Because who's keep confidence? And the future may under my vegetable crop prices are not going to go up, then what are we going to do? And 
That's why in this slide, I have not cut it off at that point and said, the good news is that crop prices have started to rise. So for the future, this negative inflation, and he managed this politically brilliantly, huh? in the time when he was managing the prices, what did he do? He announced 150% MSP. <laughs> So he got the farmers mentally on his side by saying, man, you are not 50 per SMB, but at the ground, he went there, killed the prices so that inflation doesn't affect the housewife who is going to come and vote for him. Brilliant man, okay? But there are side effects of brilliance, <laughs> okay? Must be always aware. Because I'm going to take you through this one or two more things like this, okay? So this is one of the things which has hurt Indian consumption. But as this food prices started going up, we can keep an expectation that in the next year or so, this will come. Next cause of the consumption slowdown I'm coming to is first I want to highlight to you that the government in its first term initiated drastic fundamental and game-changing reform, right? Chandan, Aadhaar, Mobile, then GST, uh, demonetization, her kism ki fundamentally very critical and when these reforms are announced, sab log ne taliyam ba jayi na? Correct? Because reforms are good. Right? But my dear friends, there is no such thing in economics as something that is a universal good. If somebody, you go to war, a civilian will get killed. <laughs> there is something called collateral damage. One. Second, all reforms, because they are reforming, you know as doctors, right? If you are trying to cure somebody, your medicines sometimes have side effects. In the process of reforming, there is always pain before the gain. So these reforms have actually caused the consumption slowdown in many, many ways. One example is the cash economy. Right? All of those cash economy got a dramatic night in Surat, we talked to your industrialist friends. They told you, I was here yesterday on calls with them. Now many people were saying, Nare, yaar, completely ye cut gai hai, cash economy nahi hai. They are still today talking about it. So demonetization, while it's good for the country, it took out the black money, it took out the counterfeit money, and all of those things in theory, it was very good political messaging, it helped to win election also. The fact is that it has helped consumption to some extent. But more importantly, I'll tell you one specific example. How a good can be a bad for somebody? Okay, I've got a graph on that, I think. Right? So that's what I'm saying. An unexpected villain of the demand is the government reforms. And the example which I have on the next slide, right? Let me tell you what I mean and then I'll show you what's hurting a key industry. A drug taking goods from Chennai to Delhi before GST was implemented used to take 7 days to go and come back because at every state you have to pay upright, you have to pay sales tax, you have to keep the vehicle, next day go, next day go. Post GST that truck takes 3 days to go and come back. Tanya, everybody says fantastic, nation foreigners will come because their goods will move faster. But what is happening? The truck operator is able to get double his turnover from the same truck today, no? So why would he buy a new truck? Right? So that's what I mean by saying that for every good point, there is a bad point. Life is a double-edged sword. Eki taraf nahi karta hai. Right? So this is just one example. The LCV production in the country. Why has it collapsed? Because say, one LCV is now able to do double the price number of trips that's needed. So please understand that you all pray for reforms and stock market should go up. Reforms means that the inefficient get hurt and the efficient will survive and grow and while the system gets cleaned up, later it is definitely good. But in the process there is pain. Why I am telling you this is that a lot of people are projecting these kind of slowdowns forever. But understand this is only a pain till it gets set right. So once you understand the cause, you will understand that this is a period that necessarily had to happen. So Mr. Modi or anybody can't go and say, you are going to see this slowdown, right? Nobody likes to address bad news and publish it. But that's the harsh reality of the situation. Hence, what happened to the country? In that graph if you saw, those of you remember that graph, right? Demand 
What does it do? There is a certain capacity in the country. When demand goes up, capacity present goes up. When capacity present hits near to peak capacity is when fresh capacity creation starts. So this is India from 2008. Our peak capacity utilization was here in 2009 at 83%. No nation can get 100%. Why? There are always useless industries in the country. As a country, an individual company can go to 85, 90, 95, sometimes 110 also it can deliver by putting more shifts and all that. But as a country, you'll never reach it. When Mr. Modi came to power, he was at 72%. All his infrastructure spending, the government took the heavy lifting, I'll show you a slide, took this up to 76. But after that, it stagnated, it didn't go up further, and it actually started coming down. Why? This is the impact of the consumption slowdown. So why I'm saying this is that from a perspective of this capex formation in our country, right, is only by the blue line which is the government of India. The private sector after massively building capacity in this period has totally shut down any expansion plans. Right? So the investment, when you saw the slide, right, Capital formation in the country, after going up into the government's efforts, has started coming down. Right? So, why I am pointing out this to you is that in this context, so this is the GDP, and those are the three components of GDP that we just discussed. So, all of these put together has pulled down our GDP. So, what should we do as a nation to set this right? Right? So, please take this up. in all of this bad news. I am saying this uh, decade ahead is a decade of phenomenal opportunity. Why? Because of the China fact. So what do I mean by this? China's growth today is declining faster than India's. In fact, Chinese GDP has hit a 28 year low in Q3. So what am I saying here? One man's meat is another man's. That is where our opportunity comes from. Where does it come from? First of all, why didn't this happen? Without doing diagnosis, we can, can't go forward. Then because the tariff war led to this. What is the tariff war? The tariff war impact on China is that China has lost 35 billion dollars of exports. Of this 35 billion dollar, 21 billion was diverted to other countries and 14 billion was either lost or went back to the US. Right? So why, why this? And look at what happened to India. We got a minuscule three quarter of a billion only from this. Why? Because we are not ready to take it today. Right? And what is this tariff for? What cost it and is it sustainable? So first thing, started with this word called what? Maga. What is that? Make America Trump. It was an election rhetoric of Trump. He had Maga hands printed and circulated. And that's how he went to the American public and said, China, Mexico, Canada, everybody is taking away your jobs, everybody is taking away your thing, I will bring it back. That's what MAGA led to the tariff war. He won the election. Why is he doing it now also? He has another election to win. <laughs> right? So why I'm saying this is that this tariff war, right, is it sustainable? Right? To answer that question, First look at what tariff has done to America. He has pulled out 35 billion dollars of imports from. But what's happened to the American GDP? Mr. Trump came to power in December 16. He started this maga maga and then what he has done to the US economy? He has engineered a slowdown in the US economy with his tariff law. But he doesn't care because to win the election he needs to continue that rhetoric. Right? So from that point of view, right? We believe that maga led war is unsustainable in the medium term. What I mean by medium term? After the election gets over. Why am I saying this? Because for this to work, the American consumer must be willing to pay significantly higher prices for the same products if it's paid in America. Now what happened is because of the Fed's pumping of money and the US economy which was starting to recover, right? The US economy was actually in a strong recovery mode when he came to power. What has happened is that US wages are at a 50 year low. 
So they're not doing US unemployment. So what happens if unemployment goes down? Wages go up. So there's no way that post the election result that this can do because America Americans will not pay five thousand dollars for iPhone which they are getting a thousand dollars today, right? So this tariff war is a temporary thing which will not last beyond 2020 December, right? And I will give this point with a very simple example. This MAGA hat. This MAGA hat was purchased from China at three dollars. But then he sold it for nine to twelve dollars, and in that much it will cost. $20. So even for his own promotional anti-China campaign, he made the hats from China. <laughs> right? So why I'm saying this is, when 2020 election happens, whether Mr. Trump comes to power or not, if Mr. Trump doesn't come to power, we have to go back to a more inclusive world, because that's the best for the, the Democrats or not, uh, they were the ones who brought the US as a tariff. But if Trump comes back to power, I'm still saying this is not sustained. Why? Well, as per US law, no American president can run for a third term. <laughs> the only reason he did this was to win an election, right? So, Mr. Trump, what will he want to win in his next term? The Nobel Peace Prize. Right? <laughs> Guess what happened to Obama, right? So, his whole thought process, you will see a very different Trump, and that is not hard to believe. You see a very different Trump every 30 seconds also. <laughs> right? So to say that he will change, suddenly he will position as a world leader, he will do manufacturing, he will do everything. Right? So this tariff war is not sustainable. So for India, is there the opportunity only short term till December 2020? No, not at all. What am I talking about here? Apart from the impact of Paris, China has more structural issues and therein lies the more sustainable opportunity for India. Because there is no demand for money and there is no competition. Because today, private sector banks are interested in merger, uh, NBFCs are not getting funding, so private sector banks are in the whole maja in front of him, say, why should I cut by the competition in AEM? So the reason they are not passing it on fully, but it's a matter of time, that it has to happen. So low inflation, low interest rates continuing, is what very supportive of consumption, right? And if we get this act in order, right, look at this. In the world middle class, 88% are from Asia, of which 14% are from India. So the consumption is the next story. So that was the capex cycle story. Right? Based on this, let's look at the potential of China. So the China has an opportunity. It is from when the journey happened for China from 2 to 10. What happened to the economy? Just look at this. Cars sold. In 2007, when China was the same market as they said 7, we are selling 3 million cars. They went to 25 million cars. Take air conditioners. We are selling 5 million air conditioners today. China sold 30 million air conditioners then. They went to? So even if we achieve one third of this growth, it's going to be a phenomenal consumption story for India. And if you run through the fact that interest rates have already been trending down, so the EMI component has been coming down, the loan tenors have been going up also. So as a result of this, today from an affordability index, Compared to 2010, today personal loans are 14 times going to be more affordable than they were then. Right? You may have a short term phase where you are seeing consumption slow down, but the longer term story and what this translates into is that when you did that LA government aspire calculation, I just take you right to the end, it shows that in cars and in room air conditioners, up to the year 2025, we are going to see a 20% per annum growth in cars and 18% per annum CAVR in consumer growth. So the consumption store is alive and kicking. And in terms of your allocation, that's got to be the key component of all your portfolios. Right? I said I won't talk markets. So just to summarize, if you stake in India, we all get near term Gajini kind of memory losses about our country. But if you take from 1960s to now, every decade, India has posted a higher GDP growth than the previous decade. In this decade, we'll probably end up at 7.1 because the early part of the decade is really high. But I'm saying the next decade, right, 7.1 is definitely going to go to 7.5 or at least to 8. 
And we know what that means for our country. Going back to Mr. Modi's dream of the 5 trillion mark. So I've done three scenarios here. One is that there is a good case, a normal, a normal case and a bad case. In the bad case, I've assumed a low inflation because when, when no demand is there, inflation is low. In a good case, I've assumed full number of inflation.